Furthermore, Jesus explained that if anyone wanted to be his disciples, they must similarly walk their lives in imitation of him, deny their self-interests, pick up their crosses, and follow him. Now, after this, you can almost feel the tension and probably more than just a little bit of confusion about what Jesus was saying because um, the disciples at this point, they didn't really yet understand what Jesus was talking to them about. And even though Jesus had not yet been crucified, all of them knew that the cross represented a physical death sentence. All of the people were familiar in that day with Roman executions because they were done in full public view as the soldiers inflicted painful death on the enemies of the state in order to discourage insurrections and rebellions. So many of the disciples, when they heard Jesus talking this way, were probably thinking to themselves, does this mean we're all going to die with Jesus at the hand of the Romans and somehow be resurrected from the dead? No doubt uh, the disciples here were, were somewhat confused. And they thought, they thought actually that the Messiah was going to triumphantly bring the Jewish nation to her former glory under King David, under the Messiah. Not to suffer from the hands of sinners and die on a Roman cross with his disciples following him in turn. That wasn't the plan. That's not what they thought. Then they would mysteriously be, be raised back to life? What could, what could this possibly mean? The disciples were confused. And um, I'm sure that it was because of this that Jesus sought to clarify with them his spiritual purposes. If you've got your Bibles with you or you can follow along on the overhead, our text this morning is from Mark chapter 9. Would you turn with me to Mark chapter 9, starting with verse 1. And he said to them, Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God has come with power. So here we see Jesus reassuring his disciples that the kingdom of God will come with power and that it would happen within the lifetime of some of the disciples who were standing there with him. The kingdom of God coming in power. Now that was something to look forward to. But what exactly did Jesus mean when he said this? What was this kingdom of power going to look like? To answer this question now that the disciples of Jesus came to believe that he was God's Messiah. You remember out on the lake just prior to this, um, Jesus came walking out to them, right? And it was important for those leaders of of, of the early church, the 12 disciples to receive clarity over their Lord's true unveiled identity. So continuing in verse 2, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up high on a mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before him. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Wow. Can you imagine being one of those three disciples? Can you imagine how being in this place would make them feel? It must have been spectacular. I've often wondered why Jesus only asked Peter, James, and John to be with him on this occasion. Now, perhaps the reason was that Peter, James, and John were chosen by Jesus to be his inner circle, that he was making a special 
effort to prepare them for leadership roles that they would be later occupying when the church was launched. It's, it's possible. That's most likely. Some people have said it's because he knew that they would cause trouble if he didn't absolutely hammer it home. I mean, the sons of thunder and Peter, right? They needed to, to see this. For whatever, whatever reason, I, I believe it's probably maybe a combination of the two. But here we see on the mountaintop that they were led to, Jesus was transfigured. And it's explained here as wearing dazzling white clothing, which was brighter and whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. Now, Matthew's gospel actually adds to this description in Matthew chapter 17, 2 tells us this, that he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light became. So in reality, we're not seeing extraordinary garments here. We're not seeing the reflection of light shining on Jesus from some outside source or this special kind of textile. It's not about that. The dazzling brightness of the white of his clothing was the brightness of the purity and the light source of God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, shining through him. As 1 Timothy chapter 6, 16 teaches. He alone is immortal and dwells in unapproachable light. No one has ever seen him, nor anyone can anyone see him. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. This is talking about the Father God. In John chapter 118, further to that, we are told concerning Jesus. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who himself is God, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So the Bible talks about the Trinity here. The Bible tells us that when Jesus, the Son of God, came into the world, that he was God veiled in the flesh. You see, man is not able to see and understand God on his own. It's not in us to do that. You can try as you might, and people have tried throughout the years, to understand God on their own. But you can't. Grace from God is needed before we can understand the nature of who he is. Grace must come through Jesus because Jesus alone is to be our representative and to fulfill the law for us. For law and prophets to be satisfied, Jesus must become human. But at the same time, in order for him to bear the weight of our sin as our spotless sacrificial lamb, Jesus must also be God. And the only way for grace to come to the human race and to be a representative of the human race was through the coming of Jesus to the earth in the flesh, born of a virgin. Our Savior must be fully man and must be fully God. Peter, James, and John had seen the human nature of Jesus walking among them. They had also seen the divine nature through the miracles that were being performed by their Savior. They were watching it unfold, but now God wanted to reinforce with them who they were actually dealing with. This is why Jesus was transfigured on this mountaintop. So that the light and the power of the core of his being as the creator and sustainer of the universe would be unveiled to them. So then Jesus was revealed in his unveiled glory to them. But what's with Elijah and Moses? What's with Elijah and Moses? How do they fit into the mix of all this? When you look at this, you see Elijah and Moses standing there talking to Jesus. Well, when you step back from this event and really think about it. Just step back from this event and think about it. The Old Testament consists of the Torah or the law of God. The first five books of the Bible. And the, what they call Nevihim, 
or the Old Testament books of the prophets, they were also written. And they are part of the Old Testament scriptures. So whose name primarily comes to mind? Whose names come to mind? When you think about the establishment of the Old Testament scriptures. Well, with the Torah, the first one that comes to mind is Moses. But who also is among the most prominent of the prophets that was written about in the scriptures, in the, in the Old Testament? Well, that would be Elijah. Elijah represents the prophetic Hebrew scriptures and Moses represents the law of the Hebrew scriptures. And the fact that the two of them were seen conferring with Jesus on this transfiguration mount suggests that both the law and the prophets actually converge and their fulfillment in the person is in the person and in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ who is shining like the sun in all of its brilliance at the center of attention. Hmm. Wow. This vision, if you think about it, it's kind of like, it was actually almost like representing a relay of sort in history. Presented to these three establishers of the covenants, the old covenant and the new covenant. With the passing of the spiritual baton from the prophets and the law to the Lord Jesus Christ. This was a significant miracle when Jesus Christ was transfigured and Moses and Elijah were conferring with him. And this is where I believe what happens next here is is significant. Peter in verse five of our text says to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And in parentheses, it says, he did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Isn't that just like Peter? (laughs) Jump in. Jesus liked that about Peter. But something happened after Peter said this. Verse 7 tells us, then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, this is my son whom I love, Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Peter, he's so human, right? He doesn't know what to do next. He knows that they're experiencing a holy moment and he's confounded. And he didn't know what to say. So rather than saying nothing, He figures that they should dig in for the night, as per se, because to him it appears that Jesus is going to have this kind of conference, I think, with Moses and Elijah, and probably are going to discuss what's going to happen next. Peter didn't realize what was being said by God in this moment of transfiguration. He didn't totally understand it. But God the Father clears it up very quickly. When he makes this suggestion, it says that a cloud appeared and covered them and the voice of the Father speaks out from the cloud. And this scene is reminiscent of the cloud that covered Mount Sinai in the Old Testament where God spoke revealing himself to their ancestors of old. You see, God chose to speak to Moses in a cloud when he was on Mount Sinai from out of a cloud. We read in Exodus chapter 24, 15 to 18, At the time of the establishment of the Old Covenant, right before the Lord gave Moses his Ten Commandments, we read, when Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it. And the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days, the cloud covered the mountain. And on the seventh day, the Lord called out to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain and he stayed on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. 
you read on in the Old Testament what happened there after he came down from the mountain, right? His face was shining so brightly they had to cover it because in the presence of God, the presence of God affected him and changed him. Here we see the establishment of a covenant with the people. God was going to establish a covenant with his people, with Moses. He was going to give them the Ten Commandments, the law. And here, in this moment of transfiguration, we see that God was also going to establish a new covenant with his people through the Lord Jesus Christ. And just before the establishment of the new covenant, just as in the establishment of the old covenant, the father spoke to his servants out of a cloud. There's this absolute significance to the entirety of these events on the transfiguration. The key leaders that God had handpicked to be the primary spokesman of the new covenant were spoken to God out of the cloud, just as he had spoken to Moses out of the cloud in the old covenant. The father made it plain to Peter, James, and John that Jesus was the son whom he loved and that they were commanded to listen to him. What a moment. Can you imagine that? Being there and seeing all that? We continue reading in verse 9 of our text. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. You see... Peter, James, and John knew that what they had witnessed was of supreme significance. Even though at the time they were trying to figure out everything and how it, what it meant, Jesus wanted them to keep these events to themselves until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And they didn't understand what Jesus was talking about, saying that the Son of Man rising from the dead uh, was significant, but as time went on, those guys would understand. They would understand very clearly what God was talking to them about at that moment. In the transfiguration, Jesus was revealed to them by the Father as being the Son of God. But here, he was revealing himself to them as being the Son of Man. If he was the Son of God, it meant that the nature of God was residing within him. And this is why the messianic prophecy that we see and we hear so much about in Isaiah chapter 9, 6 is so powerful. Where it is written, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. If he was also referring to him as, as this, himself as the son of man, he had the nature of humanity within him as well. Prophetically, he was destined to be God, to be a high priest as well of humanity. You see, a high priest represents man before God. Not just a few men, but all men. The high priest is the one that goes into the holy holies and confers with the Father God on behalf of all of humanity. And this is why it's written in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, 15 concerning Jesus. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. The spotless Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, was one with the Father, Yet, he was one with humanity, yet without sin. The disciples, see, they were on their way to understanding all of this, but 
They still had a ways to go. So with their minds being set on the appearance of Elijah and Moses in this transfiguration, they diverted the discussion and the questions they had surrounding this event uh, to Elijah. In verse 11, we read of our text, we read, and then they asked him, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? The scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, and teachers of the law had been telling the people that the Old Testament prophecies um, predicted the coming of the Messiah in Malachi. Malachi predicted the pri- prior to the coming of the Messiah that Elijah would appear to them. Malachi 3.1 says of the coming Messiah, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. And suddenly the Lord whom you are seeking will come to the, his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. That was a prophecy in Malachi 3.1. In addition, Malachi 4, 5, and 6 says this. It says, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I would come and strike the land with total destruction. So the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, they understood this prophecy of the Messiah. And to put all this in perspective, Jesus, he answers his disciples with the question concerning the coming of Elijah when he says in verse 12, he says this, Jesus replied, to be sure Elijah does come first, and restores all things. Why then it is, is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? Referring to Isaiah 53. So what Jesus said in response to Peter, James, and John was that it is true that Elijah must come first. But the more important and immediate issue which bears a greater focus than the coming of Elijah is this. Don't the Old Testament scriptures predict that the Son of Man who Elijah is to follow, or is to proceed, sorry, must suffer mistreatment and contempt from the ones that he came to save? See, they're trying to figure out Elijah and Moses fitting into the picture here. And Jesus is like, look at the main, the main point, boys. The main point is that the Savior was coming. Elijah heralds the Savior. And the scriptures predict that the Savior will suffer. The Savior must suffer much and must be rejected. And then he, can, he, can, he continues here in verse 13. He says, but I tell you, Elijah has come. And they have done to him everything they wished, just as it was written about, about him. And Jesus, he plainly tells his disciples that Elijah had come to them in the person of in the ministry of John the Baptist. And they had treated him just exactly how they wanted to. Just as the men in the days of Elijah mistreated the prophet, they mistreated John the Baptist in the same way. Now, to be fair, when you look in the scriptures, John denied that he was Elijah in the flesh. But if you recall, um, there was, before John was born, there was a prophecy given to his father, Zechariah. Zechariah was visited by an angel of the Lord, if you recall. In, uh, in the scriptures, it's written, He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. Catch that. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, prophetically speaking, the angel of the Lord told Zechariah that John would go on in the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. So what this means is that the mantle of Elijah's ministry would rest upon John 
Remember the story of Elisha and how the spirit of the Lord rested upon the spirit of the Lord that rested on Elijah also rested on Elisha. You see, Elisha was apprenticed under Elijah. He followed him around. And then when it came time for Elijah to be taken up into heaven in a chariot of fire, Elisha requested a double portion of Elijah's spirit. So the, the thing that had, had been anointed for Elijah to do, Elisha requested that, and, and it was granted. 2 Kings 2 refers to his request to be doubly blessed in his life and ministry. Interestingly, the scriptures record exactly two times as many miracles, exactly, through Elisha as through Elijah. Elisha, uh, I think there's 28 for Elisha and 14 for Elijah recorded in the scripture. See, the Lord is true to his word. And the prophecy of the coming of Elijah was fulfilled in the spirit ahead of the coming of Jesus, just as Malachi had predicted. And this is why Jesus answered this in this way. Now, I know that's a little bit, maybe a little bit confusing for everybody to understand. But you see, everything in scripture that predicted the coming of the Messiah was fulfilled. Absolutely everything. And Jesus was the fulfillment of all of that. And Jesus wished for his disciples to understand the nature of who he is. Jesus fulfills everything. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the creator and sustainer of the world. Yet the one who identifies with man as the pure, spotless Passover lamb who died instead of the people. The creator becomes the sacrifice, becomes the gateway, becomes the friend of man. Even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The pure, spotless lamb of God came and he revealed himself for who he was in that transfiguration. And the reason was is because it's important for the disciples in the establishment of the church to come. And it's also important for us to understand that Jesus Christ is the centerpiece for everything. He is absolutely the center of it all. <laughs> and sometimes I think we lose sight of the fact that Jesus is the one who walks with us who saved us, is the creator and sustainer of the universe. In his unveiled glory, his face shines like the sun. You know, John, he received this transfiguration experience. And if you recall, in the book of Revelation, when he wrote the first part of the book of Revelation, Jesus revealed himself in all of his glory in that first chapter of Revelation as well. And exactly... What happened there? John, the same guy that saw Jesus transfigured on the Transfiguration Mount, fell at Jesus' feet as though dead. The disciple that walked close. Because, you see, Christ's glory, as he walked in human form, had a veil. Well, when we see Jesus unveiled, he's the creator and sustainer of the universe. He beams like a star. <laughs> The character of Christ is so pure, is so holy, is so righteous, is so powerful that without God's shielding, we're undone. This is the Lord who has come to us. He humbled himself and became obedient to death on a cross. Why? Because of his great love for us so that we could be at one with him, so that we could be atoned, so that even though our skin, sins be like scarlet, stain. His sacrificial work washes us as white as snow, pure snow. And this is why there's so much talk in the Bible about robes of white being placed over the shoulders of the saints. <laughs> you see, 
people in robes of white. This talks about the clothing of God and his righteousness imputed to you and to me. Not because we deserve it, but by the grace of Jesus Christ. Because of his great love for us, God's grace was extended to you. So you can partake in the divine nature. Jesus cleaned you. If you believe in him, he cleans you. He forgives your sin and he makes you a place that is, that is for God to dwell How much closer can you be than have someone inside of you? You can't be any closer than that. And God made a way so that he could be with us, inside, united to us. And it's all because of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did. All of the law, all of the prophets, everything points towards Jesus. All of the New Testament scriptures, everything testifies of Jesus and points back to Jesus. Jesus, Jesus is the reason for life. Jesus is the reason that you live and move and have your being. He is everything. He is the alpha. That's the first letter in the Greek alphabet. He is the omega. The last letter of the Greek alphabet. He is everything in between. He is all in all. When you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and he gives you his gift of life, you come to a mighty, mighty, mighty God full of compassion and love. Let's not forget this. This transfiguration experience was shown to the three Disciples that would be leaders in the early church. And it was given the same reason why, in the same manner that the old covenant was given to Moses. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Amen. Would you bow with me in prayer as we close today's service?